September 10th, 2001. I learned about it early the next morning when your brother found your phone and called the last few numbers you had dialed. Our conversation the night before was short and in spite of or maybe because of it ending with you telling me I love you, it still felt unresolved. So when I saw your number on my phone, I was eager to pick up. Who is this? The voice asked. We talked for a minute. I told him who I was, and I discovered the voice belonged to your brother. Then he told me you were dead. I couldn't breathe. I'm sorry for your loss, I think I said. I know it's I know he's been really grateful for the way you've been taking care of him. Wanting to offer comfort to this man, this voice on the other end of the line, calling from my dead friend's phone, throwing these words at me. I felt like a kid playing dodgeball, and everything he said was smacking me. Every throw was making contact. In the face, in the shoulder, in the leg, in the chest, no matter how I moved, I couldn't escape his words. I was angry. Angry at the words, angry at your brother, angry that I felt the need to take care of your brother in that moment. Angry for feeling selfish, angry at myself for thinking too much, and angry for being angry. Angry at the empty room I was sitting in, and angry that you were gone. He didn't tell me you committed suicide, but it was clear to me that's what had happened. He ended with a promise to let me know when and where you would be buried. A call that never came. Moments after I hung up the phone, I would also find out about the planes hitting the towers in New York and that the world was shifting, but my world had changed already which didn't give me much space to absorb anything else. I've thought on more than one occasion, maybe you're still alive, and maybe this was your brother's way of protecting you, helping you in a moment of sobriety. Maybe this was just one more attempt to help you cut ties with a community that gave you life and also fed your decay. As details of the rest of the day began to unravel and 9-11 began to consume everyone around me, it occurred to me that for many, your death didn't really matter. Or if it did, you needed to be moved out of the way to make space for the massive grief and trauma that hit America. Leaning in to feel the collective pain of our country was perhaps easier than being left alone to grieve the death of a man we all knew was going to die. A man we all knew was ready to die. A man we all knew was waiting to die. Maybe your brother didn't have room to hurt, or maybe he was just tired of hurting and welcomed the inevitable end so he could move on with his life. I thought about my uncles, Billy, Ray, and Michael, whose deaths seemed to affect no one but my grandmother. Because when an addict finally meets their end, those of us left behind are often too worn down to feel. I thought about how painful it was to watch her grieve in isolation, even though I was still quite young, and about the strange pressure to not react, as if those of us who stood by and watched their steady descent made some kind of secret pact to stop caring, or an agreement that we, would, we had to deny their humanity with each act of violence they undertook against their mother, their wives, their kids, and ultimately themselves. I thought about my cousins who ended up in the foster care system and how I have no idea where they ended up. <clears throat> Last week, my kids, who also came through the foster care system, were talking about their greatest fears. My eldest son didn't tell me about dinosaurs or spiders. My eldest son, who is 10, says his greatest fear is that his mom will die between our visits with her and that he'll never see her again. My daughter, who is six, said her greatest fear is that their mom will keep trying to come around because she has such a hold on her big brother. 
Neither of them have the language of addiction, but they already know two sides of the same fear. Yeah. I'm often pulled between knowing that without meth, my kids would never have been brought into this world, and also realizing that meth continues to define and shape their young lives in such unfair and cumbersome ways. The night you called me, I was sitting in my car at a light on the corner where Western, Diversity, and Elston meet, a six-way intersection with so many confusing directions as three roads cross. I was heading home, not to the place where you lived with me, not to the home we had made together, but to a new place a block away. I sat through two lights while we talked and only moved again after those words, I love you. I was 26 when we met at the office. You were part of a back to work retraining program for people living with HIV who'd been out of the workforce. You were funny and kind and broken. And the world was scurrying around trying to pick you up and put you back together. Combination therapy was fighting the virus in your body like never before and your body was responding. Through the hugs and high fives and forced smiles, I could see the terror in your eyes. New pharmaceuticals had taken you from death's door back to life, but so much of you had already died. In the midst of the retraining program, you lost your job and then your apartment. How was it possible, I thought, that you were fired from a job retraining program at an HIV clinic of all fucking places? Move in with me, I said, thinking I could somehow help you live again. When we'd get up in the morning, I often watched you, standing in the mirror, watched you, watch yourself. I look skinny, you'd say, but I would catch you running your hands over your arms and your chest like a man going through puberty again. Was it too much to watch your body come back to life? Were the joyful hugs celebrating your renewed health suffocating? I could see the betrayal in your eyes. This body that had wasted away was taunting you with renewal, just when you had made peace with letting go. You'd spend days snuggled up with my dog in our house and evenings in your room. Eventually, you returned to Seattle. We'd talk on the phone at night, and I could tell you started using again. I wanted you to hang on. Correction. I wanted to hang on to you. Correction, I couldn't let you go. I started looking at jobs in Seattle. I didn't know it then, but you had already launched your goodbye tour. Seattle was your first stop to see your ex-wife. Then you went to Idaho to see your brother. I thought I could save you. I thought I could help you live again. I thought I would have more days of watching you watch yourself. More days of doggy snuggles. But just like when you moved in with me in Chicago, you didn't need someone to help you live. You needed someone to help you die, to be your witness. And none of us were strong enough to do that, which is ironic since we'd all been watching you slowly die for years, but refused to see it. Returning to work the day after you died, I pulled up in back where there was a group of people crying behind the building. Did you hear, they asked? Yeah, Lee died. What? No, a plane flew into the World Trade Center. I walked by my coworkers to my office where I closed the door and wailed as grief circles were organized all around me for the victims of 9-11. I love you, you had told me. I love you too. <laughs>